The next prize talk is uh, by Sebastian Egert, who is the award winner of the Gustav Herz Prize, which goes to a young rising star scientist at a graduate level uh, recognizing his PhD work. Sebastian did a bachelor work in Italy, in Padua. Why not? La Bella Italia, on microfluidic, um, but came back to Constance and uh, conducted electro-optical studies in the group of Alfred Leidensdorfer. Switching once means switching another time, went on to Frankfurt and joined the group of Reinhard Dörner. We have heard this name earlier today. So we have uh, high attention in uh, the other award winner and uh, did his PhD in atomic and molecular physics. And I'm not wasting further time, but we are listening to you and despite running late, it's a question of respect that he has a full 30 minutes for his prize talk and not less than that, because it's not his fault that we are running late. It's my and others' uh, responsibility. You're most welcome. Yes, uh, thanks for the kind introduction, and it's really an honor to be here today. And I'm really excited to present uh, our work on the amplitude, phase, and entanglement in strong field ionization. And the overall uh, process that we're looking at is photoionization. So um, usually, um, so the photon energy has to be larger than the binding energy um, of the electron to allow for photoionization. And for the first examples of this talk, we will use argon, which has an ionization potential on the order of 16 electron volts. And um, in case the photon energy is smaller than the ionization potential, there can still be photoionization for really high intensities if many photons act together and there can be multi-photon ionization, as we have also already seen in the first talk today. And this is only possible for very high intensities. So the intensity has to be on the order of 10 to the power of 12 watts per square centimeter. And this means um, if one calculates then the density of photons per femtosecond and square nanometer, that there are dozens of photons at, at the volume and the time scale of a single atom. And that's why they can act together and overcome the ionization potential. And if we in decrease the photon energy even further, and the photon energy goes close to zero, then there can still be ionization by a field-driven process. And this is um, possible because the electric field of the laser pulse can bend the atomic potential, and um, this then can lead to tunnel ionization through a barrier. And for this process, we need intensities which are on the order of 10 to the power of 14 watts per square centimeter. And because tunneling is so important for this talk, I quickly want to illustrate what this, what this here means. So we have a 1 over R potential as a simple case, and then we apply this external electric field of the laser pulse that bends this potential, and then an electron, which is initially bound here, can tunnel through this barrier and be then uh, liberated. And um, the laser pulses which we use, they are few cycle laser pulses. So here there's an illustration of a few cycle circularly polarized femtosecond laser pulse that propagates in this X direction here. And here the peak of the laser electric field is marked with the star here. And for this given instant in time, the electric field vector points to negative Y values. And then as, we, as time evolves, this electric field vector here rotates in the plane of polarization and decreases its length uh, because the laser pulse just fades out. And if we now look at this in position space, we have here an atom that is located 
uh, at the center of the scoring system in position space, and the electron appears at the tunnel exit, and the, the tunnel exit has, has a distance of about 10 atomic units. And 10 atomic units, that, uh, so one atomic unit is um, five over 100 nanometers, so 10 atomic units is just half a nanometer here. And Throughout my talk, I will use atomic units. So also in momentum space, one atomic unit corresponds to about 1% of the speed of light. And um, here we can also see that uh, if you now zoom out, we see that the tunnel exit position is almost at zero now, just slightly shifted to the right. And if we now uh, calculate the electron's trajectory in position space, as it's accelerated by this time-dependent laser electric field, we see this trajectory here. And we can um, also now see that as laser pulse phase out, we have a um, homogeneous movement uh, downwards here. It's the final momentum of this electron. So we can also look at this in momentum space. So in momentum space, we, have, uh, we start with the electron uh, at, with zero momentum after tunneling, and then we look how the, how the electron evolves in momentum space, and we see that the momenta converge to a given final momentum here, which is by definition just given by the negative vector potential. And this negative vector potential just uh, corresp corresponds to the integral of all the forces that acted up on the electron after tunneling. And all possible negative vector potentials, here they are in a circle, due to the symmetry of circularly polarized light. And the expected final momenta that we can measure in our lab using a cold trans reaction microscope that was already introduced today by one of the co-inventors. And um, this expectation for the final electron momentum is then um, given by this negative vector potential. And if we do our measurement then, we also see that here the most probable electron momenta are really close to the circle and have, have to have this donut-like distribution. And so this model works very well to, the, to model strong field ionization. And here we only see a projection to the um, polarization plane in momentum space, but what we measure is really the three-dimensional momentum distribution of this donut-like distribution, and this all looks like this here is the measured data in, represented in three dimensions. And because this is so important, I quickly want to summarize this idea of this two-step process. So we have circularly polarized light, then we have tunneling, which is a quantum mechanical process, and after tunneling, we have a classical motion in this time-dependent laser field, which is um, the second step in this two-step model. And the final momentum is then just given by this negative vector potential to a good approximation. And the scope of my talk is that um, we want to understand what are the properties of this electron. So this electron is not a point particle, but it's a quantum mechanical particle, so it has a wave function which has an amplitude. So we want to understand what affects the amplitude of this wave function. And in the, next, in the second step, we want to understand uh, what uh, determines the phase, or how can we even measure the phase of this electronic wave function here in the continuum. And in the third step, we will look for a fingerprint of entanglement somewhere in this strong field ionization regime. And in order to address those questions, we need an experimental setup. So I will quickly introduce this, uh, the one to you which we are using. So we start with femtosecond laser pulses at 780 nanometers, and we frequency double them, and then we have a interferometric laser setup, and we focus them inside our vacuum chamber, we focus them onto a gas jet, and reach intensities of, um, which are on the order of 10 to the 15 watts per square centimeter. And we can, with this interferometer, we can tailor the intensity, the ellipticity, and the orientation of the main axis of the ellipse for both colors individually, and we can also set the relative time delay of the two colors using a nanometer delay stage. And then we use those laser pulses, those tailored laser pulses, and send them into our vacuum chamber and focus them onto a gas jet here. And in the overlap of gas jet and laser, the ionization occurs, and then we guide them by electric and static, static electric and static magnetic fields, as described today by Joachim Ulrich here in this first talk, to electron detector and ion detector. And we can measure the electron momentum resolution with one over 100 atomic units. That's uh, 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 a resolution. And we can also measure the charge states and the ions. And it's really that I always show this slide with, with this citation. It's, uh, it's really this way, um, not for this day today. Um, so um, then one key finding that, we, uh, that I want to present to you is that uh, an argon ion 
we can have this prepared in a way that we have a certain um, an electron with a defined magnetic quantum number, and in this case, the magnetic quantum number can have a rotation which is in a semi-classical way um, anti-parallel to the um, or opposite to the helicity of the light field. So this area of the light field is opposite to the area of this magnetic quantum number, and then we can measure the electron. Uh, electron energy, and then we see an energy distribution, so vertically we see the probability for ionization as a function of the electron's energy. And now we can leave everything in this experiment as, as, as before, so we leave the um, light field as before, the same helicity here, we just invert the helicity of the, the ring current, or the helicity of this m quantum number, we just invert this one, and then we measure this electronic um, electron spectrum again, and then we see that this electron energy spectrum is very different, and we also see that the overall, the integral of those two curves is different. And this is really important because it tells us that um, tunneling is sensitive to the relative um, direction of the, the bound electrons, magnetic quantum number, and the rotational direction of the laser field. And that's called non-adiabatic tunneling, when this time evolution of the laser field is important. And so we are sensitive to the sign of the ring current for strong field ionization. And that's a, the first take-home message of my talk. So non adiabatic tunneling acts like a polarizer and selectively liberates m equals minus 1 electrons for tunneling. And that is also the, we have, it have answered this first um, task here. So we know that the magnetic quantum number affects um, the, the probability for electrons to be transferred through the tunnel, and it also affects the electron energy distribution. So that's a property of the amplitude in momentum space. So next we want to uh, look at the phase in momentum space. And before I come to this point, I quickly want to do a, a thought experiment. So we here have a laser pulse, which is a femtosecond laser pulse. We have a hydrogen molecule with a certain orientation of the molecular axis, and we have an electron detector. And now we apply this femtosecond laser pulse, we let it cross this, this line here, we record the time T1, then ionization occurs, and the electron finally hits the detector, and that's the time T2. And now we measure the time delay between those two instants in time. And next we want to change the molecular orientation with respect to the electron's emission direction. And now we can ask the question, does this somehow change this time, delta tau? So does delta tau depend on beta here? And this very basic question um, is, is now addressed on the, during the next few slides. And of course, one can ask, why should there be any dependence? And to illustrate that, we look at the bound electronic wave function um, in a hydrogen molecule. Here, the molecular axis is aligned horizontally, and color-coded is the probability for an electron to be at this position. Here, the unit is angstrom and the tunnel exit position points to the right. Then we have an electron detector down here, and we have a wave packet after tunneling, um, which is uh, shown here. And for, for a later time, this wave packet has almost reached the detector. And if we now rotate the molecule by 90 degrees, the most probable position at the tunnel exit will not shift towards or away from the detect detector. But if we uh, change the molecular orientation by minus 45 or by plus 45 degrees, this, this wave packet will shift uh, to, uh, away or towards the detector. And for all the other possible molecular orientations, we have different position offsets. And now it's really intuitive to calculate a change in arrival time as a function, or just calculate a change in arrival time by change of this position offset divided by the electron's velocity, and the electron's velocity is just its momentum divided by its mass. So we have this really simple prediction for a change in arrival time for this scenario, and we can calculate using this formula this plot here. This shows the electron energy as a radius, and we see beta, which is just the electron emission direction with respect to the molecular axis. And for beta equals zero, the electron is emitted along the molecular axis, and for beta equals 90 degrees, the electron is emitted perpendicular to the molecular axis. And um, now we see that for emission parallel or perpendicular, we have zero change in time delay, and in between we have time delays on the order of 40 or minus 40 attoseconds. That's are, of course, very short time delays, and um, we can now, of course, ask ourselves, can we somehow measure this, or is this only a simple prediction which cannot be measured? And um, 
To this end, we developed a scheme where we superimpose two laser passes, one where we strong laser pass at 390 nanometers, and one where we weak laser pass at 780 nanometers, and both uh, laser passes are circularly polarized and rotate in the same direction. And here we see the coherent superposition of those two electric field vectors that have this one-fold symmetric combined electric field. And one can also calculate the corresponding vector potential, which also has this characteristic shape. And the measured electron momentum distribution for this case looks a bit similar to this donut-like distribution, but now we see a substructure, which is a sub-cycle interference that we call this the alternating half-ring pattern. And from this alternating half-ring pattern, we can now analyze um, the, this change in um, time delay. And to this end, we developed a scheme which is called holographic angular streaking of electrons. That's the PhD work by Daniel Travert. Um, and so the change, uh, so the change in the, we analyze this interference pattern, we apply haze, and then we get directly those experimentally obtained changes in the Wigner time delay or in this time delay here. And that, of course, agrees very well with our extremely simple prediction. And we did not believe this first, so we asked a real theoretician to do a, a proper simulation. And um, Simon Brennecke from the group of Manfred Lyon here from Hannover, he solved then the Schrödinger equation on the grid and um, then obtained independently the change in Wigner time delay. And that's the result here. And apart from a slight overall rotation, which can be understood along those other clocks discussion, we have a very good agreement. And that, of course, uh, tells us that our really simple understanding is a quite a good start to understand what's happening for the strong field ionization of H2. And by definition, the Wigner time delay is the derivative of the phase of the electronic wave function with respect to energy. And this tells us also that we, have, we measure the Wigner time delay, and this is confirmed by TDSE calculations, so those, those numerical calculations by Simon Brennecke, and we have learned something about the phase of the electronic wave function in momentum space. So we have achieved the second goal of our talk. And in the last part of the talk, we will ask, is there somewhere a fingerprint of entanglement? And the very basic idea how the scheme works is now hand-wavingly explained. So we have electrons in the ground state of oxygen molecules and in bound electron, in bound, so <laughs> electrons in bound molecular states, they are naturally entangled. And now we apply a laser pulse to trigger the association of this molecular state. And we start with the ground state of molecular ox oxygen, where the projection of the orbital angular momentum to the molecular axis is zero. We apply a, a circularly polarized laser pulse um, and then the, we have a dissociative state, which is a pi state. And here, this value for lambda here is minus one. And then we wait until this state dissociates into two atoms. And when those two atoms are about 50 nanometers apart, that happens after about um, 1.5 picoseconds, it's a very good approximation to describe this as a linear combination of two atomic orbitals. And now the sum of those two magnetic quantum numbers here must add up to the value for the projection of the orbital momentum of the associative state. And therefore we know that the sum of those two magnetic quantum numbers must be minus one. And now we can um, ask the question, are the electrons at site A still entangled with the electrons at site B? And to really to truly explain what I mean by entanglement is, so we have two scenarios here. At site A, m is equals minus one. At site B, m is equals zero, or the other way around. And we can have one wave function to describe this one. We can have one wave function to describe this one. And that's a classical correlated state where it's in 50% of the cases, it's this one scenario. And in 50% of the cases, it's the other scenario. Or we can have an entangled state where in 100% of the cases, we have just a superposition of those two possible scenarios here. And our goal is to do an experiment that can distinguish a co classically correlated state from an entangled state in strong field ionization. And that's our overall scheme. So we have a molecule, and using this Coltrane's reaction microscope, we can, in the analysis, post-select the molecular orientation um, with respect to the light propagation direction. So here we post-selected molecules that were perpendicular to the light propagation direction, and then we applied a pump pulse that triggered the association of the molecule, and then we applied a propulse that led to um, 
one of those two cases. Case A was we produced one electron and one ion. And case B was we produced two electrons and two ions. And in the first step, we only look at case A and at the energy distribution of this first electron here. And now we can distinguish two scenarios. Scenario A is that pump and probe have the same helicity here. That's shown in uh, red. And we can also look at the case where pump and probe have different helicities. That's here shown in blue. And we see almost no difference for this energy-dependent uh, yield. And now we can also look at the case where we post-select molecules that were aligned along the molecular axis. Uh, so, I mean molecules that were uh, aligned along the light propagation direction here. And in this case, we again can look at this, this difference here, and here we see a huge difference. So the, that's, that's an important insight, because it reminds us about this M-selective tunneling a lot, and we know that the dissociating molecule stores information about the helicity of the pump pulse, because the helicity of this pump pulse somehow can only survive this information if the molecule here in between remembers the helicity of this pump pulse. And that's an important finding because now we can build on this and we know that non everybody tunneling acts like a polarizer and selectively liberates m equals minus one electrons. So in one case we had just more m equals minus one electrons because the pump pulse prepared them. And in the next step we have now um, a new quantity which is, oh and that's really important, I, had, I forgot to mention that those measurements here were done by Pierre Daum and Paula Roth uh, who are students in our group. And that's really an exciting uh, finding by them. And um, now we have the light quantization axis and the molecular axis, and the intermediate angle of those two uh, quantization axes is called gamma. And now we measure um, two probabilities as a function of gamma, the probability for case A and the probability for case B. And the reason why this might be interesting is that if the first atom is ionized, this affects the wave function of the second atom if those two are entangled, and this then can affect the probability for double ionization. And then we search for a fingerprint of entanglement. And here is the experimental data for case A. So here is the value gamma, which is this intermediate angle of those two quantization axes. And here is the probability to detect um, um, case A. And we have again those two cases where the, the, uh, so the two scenarios where the pump and the propulse have the same helicity or where they have different helicities. And, and then we uh, use a classical model. We adjust all three parameters of this model using the data from case A. And then we make a prediction using this model for case B. And then we com can compare the prediction for case B with the measure measured result. And we see only moderate agreement. In comparison, we can also use a mo model that includes entanglement. And here um, we again adjust all three parameters of this model using the data for case A. And then we make a prediction using this model with entanglement for case B. And there we have a much better agreement. And, and that's, uh, of course, the key finding here that we, that we can distinguish. If there is a quantity in strong field ionization that is sensitive to, uh, and can detect if there is entangle entanglement or not. And, it can, and uh, we have better agreement with our data using the model with entanglement. And this shows us that there's a fingerprint of entanglement in, in spatially separated atoms um, on femtosecond time scales. And then we can uh, we find that this, this scenario here is the case. And finally, we have also answered this question here by uh, yes. And, <laughs> and with I want to thank the entire group of Reinhard Dörner, and in particular um, the people that are listed here. And I also wanted to let you know that we are hiring, so if you're looking for a PhD position or a postdoc position, write me an email or uh, talk to me after the talk. And of course, I thank you for your intention, and, uh, and today there are no questions I've just learned, but anyways, I'm open for your questions after the talk. Thank you. <laughs>